and with the Energy Division. And um, he has just a few comments about our implementation plan, which was submitted about a month ago. Welcome. Good morning. Nice to see you again. Um, I think I was here uh, for your January 12th meeting. And at that time, um, the commission staff was in the midst of reviewing uh, Marin's implementation plan. And we hadn't completed our review yet. Um, so basically the update for today is the staff has completed its review and we uh, prepared a recommendation to our executive director of our commission to uh, issue a letter certifying our receipt of the plan and if, if we don't see any problems with it. Staff has not been able to identify any programs currently available to the county that can result in such an ongoing budget savings. To make the staff recommendation today, we have spent many hours with multiple staff assessing the costs and benefits of this decision. The pragmatic staff analysis has determined that to not only make dramatic strides towards our greenhouse gas reduction targets and our renewable energy goals, but also, and this is important, save general fund revenue for ongoing programs, it is recommended that your board select one of the options presented here that would allow this program to launch. Don, um, a key issue that we're grappling with today is this assessment of risk and potential risk to the general fund of the taxpayer. And I just wonder if you can identify any risk vectors that I'm not able to articulate because what I understand and what was implied in various statements by individuals in the grand jury is that somehow NEA creates risk because of operations or other things. And my understanding at this point is that the only risk that's significant that the board is being asked to consider today is the risk that is purposefully perpetrated by PG&E's efforts to force the Marine Energy Authority to go into default. Is there, in other words, by using litigation strategies to harass and stop the MEA from reaching the go live launch dates in May and June? And so that purposeful activity is real and it is clearly happening. But I just wonder, there's been a lot of confusion for our citizens who are being led to believe that somehow NEA itself creates a lot of risk. And my argument has consistently been that it's not NEA creating the risk, it's PG&E forcing NEA to default on its startup activities. Can you help me? Am I missing something? Is there something else that I, we should be mentioning? It is a huge risk. I mean, PG&E's efforts are potentially lethal. But I just want to know if there's something else that we should, in good faith, be bringing up. Because um, that has gotten me into kind of a linguistic argument with individuals and members of the grand jury and so forth. And the, 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 the concern I had and the relevant piece for our response to the grand jury that this board will have to approve sometime in the next month or so is this issue. And... <coughs> I know that today the pertinent issue is what is the risk of MEA defaulting on a cosign that the county is being asked to offer, but I just want to make sure that I'm clear at least on what the causes of that risk really are. Okay, um, yeah, I think that the, the it is helpful to separate the risk into those two parts. So, um, and I would agree with your analysis that the risk, the relevant risk, um, for today's discussion is the risk of MEA's default, um, which uh, would um, would only be likely in the event where our incumbent utility is uh, working against MEA in a legal or other realm. Um, we believe that that risk is being managed in a number of ways and that we've shifted the, we've arranged the tranching of the program to really minimize the risk of that impacting the county's security. So I want to make sure that that's clear. That change that we made uh, just in the last week, I think, has a big impact on the level of that risk to the county. So I want to make sure that that's clear. But, but you're right that that risk is um, due to um, interference from our company utility. Um, as far as the 
rate payer risk, what's being called rate payer risk. Uh, I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of misunderstanding on this front. And, and just to clarify, the, the situation that we're in right now is actually um, much more risky because customers, rate payers, are given only one option to, um, of what to pay for their energy costs. If they don't want to pay their energy bill, then their only other option is to go without power. And that's not a, a, an actual choice for many people. <coughs> if, if MEA uh, was to be offering this Marine Clean Energy Program, then ratepayers then have less risk because they can choose who they want to be a customer of. They can decide if, if one, uh, one provider's rates go too high, they simply can shift to the other provider. Right now, they don't have that choice. Um, there is no, uh, no rule or no component of the plan that forces ratepayers to remain customers of MEA. They will always have a choice to go back to the incumbent utility. Thank you. And then just the, the other quick comment I want to make since time probably won't allow at the end. I just want to say on the record how deeply grateful I am to the three citizens that have stepped up offering the first tranche loans or cosigns. That's an extraordinary act of bravery. That's an extraordinary act of bravery, and they have, in a sense, provided this cosign guarantee or outright loans to the MEA to ins help insulate the taxpayer. Because it is literally true that if MEA is forced into default by PG&E's legal antics, those citizens are the ones taking the greatest risks now. And I just want to personally say for the record, how extraordinarily brave and how grateful this supervisor is for those citizens who have stepped up in that regard. It's enormous and it's a huge lift relative to our efforts to take advantage of as little general fund risk these days as, as possible. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you, Madam President. Okay, we're just doing questions. Any questions? Well, supervisor? if I could, um, I think that this is an important point to respond to. Um, Clearly, there are enormous risks associated with the CCA that are predicated by PG&E's efforts. The, the initiative being, in, you know, an overwhelming one that, that looms uh, before us, uh, many, many, many different ways for business attacks. But uh, unlike Supervisor McGlashan, I believe that there is a broader risk than the PG&E risk. Um, the energy industry in the last 50 years has been extremely volatile. To suggest that there is no inherent risk in this industry is naive. In addition to that, no, 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 no. I think we're here to make a financing decision. But, but, but I just need to say that it, does, it is not helpful to imply that there is no risk other than the risk of PCD. There is a risk inherent in what we're doing. I happen to have supported that risk, and I continue to support that risk, but I do think it's important to understand that in the environment that we're operating in, there is a significant risk with a startup business in a very volatile in energy industry. Thank you. Thank you. On Thursday, the MEA board is scheduled to approve the final contract. And at that time, the MEA board will be asked to designate authority to the chair to, um, to execute the confirmation of the contract, which is the, really the final step in uh, having the um, power <coughs> deliveries begin, so to speak. Uh, Don, uh, Supervisor Kinsey raised a very valid point. And again, it's kind of the linguistic challenge that we're under in explaining this. Um, so I want to phrase a question. The supervisor mentioned that the energy markets are ruthless, and in fact, I acknowledge that they are. It is a very risky place to live. My analysis with our consulting advisors, Navigant, and the attorneys and so forth, though, continues to suggest that 
the risks to MEA are roughly equivalent to the same energy market risks that we endure as ratepayers to PG E. And so I'm not saying that it's a riskless opportunity. What I keep kind of bringing up is that the risks are kind of the same. Right now, we are paying to bail out pg e from their last bankruptcy eight years ago. And so the critical point, I think, in, in deference to what the supervisor raised, there are separate startup risks that small enterprises, even government enterprises like ours, there is an extra risk caused just by the mere fact that one is a startup, but I don't want the public to be confused by the repeated assertions and implications that somehow MEA is at greater risk in the energy market than PG&E would be. And I think one of the things that we worked hard over the last year to achieve was to get a very powerful broker, a big bad wolf, if you will, in the form of a very credible, powerful company like Shell Energy North America, in fact, to insulate that operating risk that might differentiate between the Energy Authority and PG&E. And we took some criticism for selecting that, but I know my board colleagues and I at NEA were very careful to choose a very powerful broker that wouldn't get burned in the market. We insulated that further with the hiring of Sempra Energy to do all of the cost accounting and transaction verification services and stuff. So my question to you is, am I understanding that correctly? Because the pertinent issue is what's different that Marin County is contemplating here versus the status quo? And when I try to use shorthand, I get you know burned or dinged for making seemingly naive comments. And I don't mean to be naive at all. The fact is, is What's really pertinent is the difference in the risk profiles caused either by being a startup or caused by being MEA instead of PG&E. Absolutely correct. And the one clarification I'd like to make is that if things went haywire in the energy markets, let's say prices skyrocketed or something like that, um, we do have a five-year locked-in contract. So our costs, MEA's costs cut to customers would not change under that scenario. Uh, but if something else went wrong, if, if there was some ultimate failure and MEA was not able to serve customers as we had planned, there is the CPUC in, in their um, foresight uh, has required that any CCA that gets started needs to post a bond at the very beginning of service. That's actually part of our implementation budget that we're uh, talking about today. We'll be posting a bond that would cover the costs to our incumbent utility of reabsorbing customers if we were to fail. So the uh, incumbent utility, they're considered the provider of last resort. They're required to um, uh, take the customers back, but they are also required to not um, cause any increase in rates to their remaining customers or to the customers that are getting transferred back. So the bond set aside is established to cover that cost of uh, transferring customers back. Also, I think it's important for folks that might not be super familiar with the electricity grid, this type of failure doesn't have any impact on whether the lights go out or something like that. The California ISO is responsible for keeping the lights on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, they have to get paid by us and by our incumbent utility for that service. Uh, so there's a money shuffle that happens, but there's not a, a, the type of impact where we see people's lights going out. Okay, is that it for the questions? All right, now it's going to be public. public uh, is going to have a chance to talk. Let me just let me just preface before we start by saying that <coughs> this board has voted we are in CCA. All we're deciding today is are we going to guarantee an additional <coughs> loan besides the loan that we have already made to CCA and we need to decide that today. And you know it is a it is a quarter till eleven. We have eight more items on the agenda, and as you could hear just in the questions, the board has a lot of questions, a lot of comments that we want to make to each other. However, we certainly want to give the public a right to speak. Thank you. Uh, I'm here for the Sierra Club, and I say the billions start here, right here. We need to start right here doing this. Uh, you, some of the supervisors asked for other people to bring skin to the game. That skin has arrived. It's arrived with a little bit of blood on it also. Uh, but it's here. The skin is here. And we ask that you continue to support the loan. Essentially, if you don't support the loan, the money that's invested will be gone. That's a certainty. If you do invest in the loan, 
there's a risk. There's an admitted risk that more money would be lost. But if you don't invest the loan, there's a certainty that that money already invested will be lost. Now, I've got a couple of uh, agenda items here from 2008, where a $20 million loan was advanced to the Marin Healthcare District, a $3 million loan advanced to the Ross Valley Flood Control District. This is usual business. This PG&E did not come running out of the woods objecting to those loans. They're here today threatening a, 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 an issue on this, and it's, and lastly, lastly, this is international significance. I want to submit a letter from the Pope. Carl. <laughs> We get a two. We get a two. Luke Romain, Mayor of Fairfax, and I'm Larry Bragman, I'm the Vice Mayor of Fairfax. We wanted to let you know that tomorrow night we're going to be discussing joining you in the guarantee of the loan in question. We very much <laughs> that you will move forward and that we will be able to join you in this venture. You are not the only ones with skin in the game. Yeah. And I want you to also keep in mind, you know, we're talking more than economic risk here. That's right. We are currently at risk of another PG&E bankruptcy. We are at risk every day from global warming and climate change. And those risks need to be addressed and held in at least as high esteem. This is our opportunity to stand up to the bully. And we are with you. We have been with you from the start, and we hope to God that you move forward. Thank you. I just want to say, give, give choice a chance. Thank you. Thank you. Keep clapping. I'm going to start taking time off. I'm told you want clapping. We've got to get through this. Go ahead. Would you, would you keep your um, thing raised so I can watch it? Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, my name is Lori Grace. I'm representing my sister who could not be here, who is offering collateral to this loan. I have been asked by her to evaluate the financial and legal uh, uh, <coughs> standing of uh, MEA. I've been highly impressed. I've put in probably 20 to 30 hours studying this. And I have hired three independent counsels not associated with MEA to evaluate this risk and uh, one other, um, in addition to JBS and MRW, one other financial uh, company to evaluate the risk. I think that the risks of us not going ahead with, um, with this initiative to provide energy at 25% renewable energy for all the towns that have offered and 100% renewable energy for, for the deep green option is going to end up with us having more costs due to Global warming impacts, as a uh, uh, Al Gore uh, climate project trainee, I am well aware that the droughts and, and the uh, dry lightning and the forest fires are, impacted, are impacting us. So I see the cost saving as a preventative measure. I'm Elizabeth Moody from Mill Valley. And, uh, I'm Elizabeth Moody from Mill Valley and uh, the community choice aggregation has been successfully implemented in Massachusetts and Ohio, and 25% of our California citizens are under public utilities, Sacramento, Los Angeles, San Diego, and I see no risk whatever in our moving ahead and a lot of benefit in the long run with these many more local renewables that are in energy authority will be able to implement and I certainly hope that you move ahead. Good morning, I'm uh, Bill Carney. I'm uh, president of Sustainable San Rafael. I'd like to take the chair's um, suggestion and ask everybody who supports your act, your positive action this morning to support MCE to stand up and let you know that. Um, and I just want to Are you ask Thank you. I want to ask that you stay true to the very practical vision that this board and this county have established over the last eight years to accomplish meaningful change in reducing uh, greenhouse gases. Um, it is 
certainly the most cost-effective way, perhaps the only way, that we're going to achieve those reductions is to get a green grid. I also very much appreciate your stewardship of our public resources. That has resulted in a financially solid structure moving forward. Uh, the keystone of that and really the definition of prudence is that we are making significant reductions in greenhouse gas emissions through MCA, MCE by redirecting existing expenditures for electricity. There are no new tax dollar funds here, uh, no new funds Your involved. Time is up. Thank, you. Thank you very much for staying the course. Good morning. Uh, Bob Spofford uh, from San Rafael. I'd like to expand a little on this question that uh, Supervisor Kinsey raised about uh, operational risk and the craziness of the energy business. I would remind you that one out of every four households in this state gets their electricity from a municipal power company from places as small as Healdsburg to places as large as Los Angeles, uh, those municipal power companies consistently beat the investor-owned utilities on price. Those people pay 20% less. Most of them have options for automatically getting more green power than they get from BG&E. And none of them went crazy or went bankrupt during the Enron and deregulation Craziness. So I, on the track record, moving to a quasi-municipal power company like MCE is probably a safer move than staying with PG&E and the risks of the investor-owned world. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Supervisors. My name is Ed Mainland. I'm a resident of uh, county territory in Nevada, and I'm a chair of the State Sierra Club Energy uh, Climate Commission. Just two brief points. Um, these flyers that we've been getting from PG&E and the millions of dollars this uh, corporation has put into the uh, anti-NEA effort, I think are the best indication that you're on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> NEA is being validated by PG&E because they fear and know you're going to make it work. So that's why I would urge you to keep moving forward with this loan guarantee. Uh, and from the Sierra Club standpoint, you're not just acting for Marin here. This has significant, uh, significant implications for the whole state. The whole state and the country are looking at Marin to see how you're going ahead or you're not going ahead. This is terribly important. Now, just to answer Steve Kinsey's comment. Sorry. <laughs> Good day. Um, my name is Ed Boyce from San Rafael. Uh, I considered when I heard the Supreme of the Supreme Court decision giving corporations unlimited power to influence elections, and when I keep getting this garbage in my mail, and when I hear our one one-time supervisor and formerly respected. And acting as a common mouthpiece for PG&E, I'm remind. I felt like the newscaster in the movie Network, who said, "Open your window and say, I, I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore." Well, I, I did that on Saturday, but I bet you. Didn't know. <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> did you hear me yelling? That's back? why I'm not coming to speak for you, you folks. Uh, countersigning the loans. I hope you'll press ahead with that. Thank you. Hello, Supervisors. My name is John Hanley. I live in San Anselmo, California. I am not drinking the Kool-Aid. What you're doing here is you're risking our funds. I am a shareholder for the County of Marin, and you're risking our funds. I ask each of you, how is our retirement system doing? How is our unfunded retiree health doing. So now we're going to jump in into the uh, electricity game? I don't think it's wise, Supervisors. Where are our fire roads for fire protection? Are we set for a fire? I don't think so. And let me point it, point it out bluntly. The word bravery is reserved for those soldiers that are in Afghanistan or are police officers or firefighters. To invest in a company is not brave. I urge you to vote no on expending our money. To vote no I urge you to think this through. 
this is not a good policy at this time when the state is going to cut our influx of funds. We don't know what we're going to get in June, and yet you're going to loan somebody $100 million who some of the corporation previously worked on Enron. That's what you're getting your hands into. <laughs> co-founded Sustainable Fairfax. Um, I just want to thank everyone for participating in 10 years of a gestation period for this effort. And what I, what Marine Clean Energy represents to me is, is a lot of things, but one of the main things it represents, I think, is long-term planning. And we've finally reached a point, because of climate change, that we include nature now in our long-term planning. Because nature is what gives us food, water, shelter. We don't live without nature. There was a time when we only made decisions based on money. And you see where it's brought us to. Those decisions only based on money is why we have climate change. And the reason that I trust you people and, and, and the rest of the, my community representatives, because I know that they care about this community. I know that PG&E does not really care about this community. I know what they care about is their bottom line, which is transmission, which is the reason that they're fighting this, which is the reason they do not want this repeated across the state, distributed generation. Let me just say one more thing. It is like, if, we, if this is not supported, it is like eating seeds in a famine. Yes, we're in hard economic times, but the first thing that gets thrown overboard is long-term planning. We don't need that <coughs> with what we have we're facing. Thank you so much. So Marla Fields from Nevada. Um, I just want to say the one thing that Ed Mainland, the state energy chair from the Sierra Club, wasn't able to say because he ran out of time, which is that uh, the more renewable power you have, the less risk you have. And uh, with marine uh, clean energy, you're going to be get growing to 100% renewable energy. That is something that PG&E uh, has said that they will never be able to achieve. So please keep that in mind. Um, the other thing I want to say is, you know, I've, I've been here before you before to talk about the environmental benefits. It's clear that this offers 50 times uh, the combined amount of um, uh, emission savings than any of the other local projects that we have options for. Um, but there's also some serious financial benefits to moving forward with this loan, especially the way that it's been positioned here today. Um, I think it's incredible that you saw a public-private sort of partnership, that we have incredible, um, you know, community members who are willing to step forward. Uh, the real risks are, as you said, that pg and &E will, will threaten legally and stop this. But that risk really happens at the first beginning um, before we get going. And you don't have that risk. That risk lies with the folks who um, have stepped up to the plate uh, in the initial phase. So your risk is really very minimal, and I appreciate that you'll move forward and give us all a choice. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Mark Trotter. I'm a resident of Sausalito, member of the school board there. Uh, last year, Germany installed three gigawatts of solar power. That's 3,000 megawatts. Uh, Spain did the same thing in about 18 months. China is building solar power, biogas, all sorts of alternative energy production and uh, solar power manufacturing facilities faster than you can even count. Uh, in the, since 2005, when the renewable portfolio standard was, was put into place and PG&E is supposed to have 20% renewable power, they have accomplished virtually nothing uh, on that goal. There is no market as an energy developer. There's almost no market for alternative energy because the utilities don't want it. So the rest of the world is moving ahead. In this country, we're still arguing about whether or not global warming is a reality. <laughs> it's time. It's time to move forward. It's time to be bold. You guys were elected to make decisions for us. Sometimes you have to spend our money. Sometimes you have to take risks. Please take the risk, be bold, move forward, and support Marine Corps now. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, board members. My name is Joe Nation. I'm here representing the Common Sense Coalition of Marin. And, and I wish the other 2,062 members of that coalition could be here with me today. That's the number that has opted in 
to ask for more information about MEA, and they've done that, I think, because they see risk and they see little benefits with this. Um, two weeks ago, you voted not to withdraw from the MEA, but you made it clear that the issue of whether you put the county taxpayer at risk uh, for debts and liabilities was a different issue. Now MEA is back, and they're asking for $2 million, which will grow to $10 million, that's in their plan, which will grow to $375 million. This is, a, this is a, a risk that gets larger by the day, and every day that you continue to say yes, that risk will grow. Um, I would ask you to look at the plan. Look at what MEA has put together. They initially said we'll give you a price guarantee, we'll meet or beat pg &E for five years. Now, if the IJ is right today, last night they said we'll meet pg &E for year one, but not in subsequent years. Look at the greenhouse reduc gas reductions from the plan. They're actually worse. It takes us in the wrong direction compared to where pg &E is today. I'm glad to go through those numbers with you. Third, there's this notion that somehow if you move forward, you will be able to save funds um, because AB 32 compliance costs are going to be so high. In fact, if you look at the CARB website, there will be no direct regulation of a single entity in this county. That is an absolute fallacy that's been suggested to you. I would ask you to um, not to throw good money after bad, to stop funding the initiative. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Good morning, Supervisors. It's great to be here. My name is Kiki Laporta, President of Sustainable Marin. I'm going to talk real fast. I represent Sustainable Nevada, Sustainable Mill Valley, Sustainable Fairfax, Sustainable San Anselmo, Sustainable Ross, and Sustainable San Rafael. That's quite a few people, maybe more than 2,200. Um, we're here today to urge you to continue your support of Marin Clean Energy in underwriting this loan. We uh, perhaps have seen the front of the IJ today. PG&E's board has committed $30 million to defeat community choice in the state. Um, they've authorized $30 million even though um, they are prohibited by the CPUC from, doing, from impeding or interfering with CCAs. They're hoping that they can wait us out, hold the ball till the buzzer rings. What we'd like to do is to point out once again, by supporting the loan, you will get your money back money back to the county that you've loaned us. Two-thirds of our 2020 greenhouse goals will be met. AB 32 compliance at no additional cost, virtually no cost. Mechanisms and revenue streams for energy efficiency programs, clean tech, local job training and employment, local renewable assets and future tax revenues. $75 million a, uh, $1,000 a year, five years. And uh, don't forget, that the natural gas that we spoke about explodes and needs to be transported. It's a fossil fuel. And we're looking forward to your legacy being one that you'll be proud of and we'll be proud of you for it. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Well, do you have questions? Yes, there were. Do you have the staff? Okay, yes, there, there were a couple of points that were raised by members of the public. Um, one related to does MEA really have the expertise on board to run this energy um, plan? Um, the second is the comment that Mr. Nation made about a $375 million hit to the county. I've never seen anything in any of the plans that said that. I, I think it's a fabrication, but I want to just um, confirm that with you. And then um, the issue about the cost for electric yeah. distribution. Um, that, that I think that's the part of the PG&E is taking their part of it to be the distributors, but I think that needs clarifying too. Sure, I can respond to those. Um, the first question is on the operational risk. And we, we touched on this earlier before public comment. The, uh, the way to address and manage the operational risk is to ensure that we have an experienced team, that we're following the business plan that's been vetted by multiple peer reviews, and that we're following the implementation plan, which has been vetted by the CPUC. Um, we do anticipate bringing on uh, a number of um, technical staff in addition to communication staff, regulatory staff. Um, we'll be able to um, monitor the full requirements uh, contract that our power supplier will be providing 
um, knowing that they'll be doing a lot of the scheduling and technical interface with the California ISO, our role will be to monitor that closely uh, and, and do um, uh, regular audits to make sure that everything is in compliance. But we'll also be bringing on technical staff that will be looking at developing the projects. And uh, we already have a, a very strong technical um, consulting firm that's been um, leading, bringing us this far and um, who have experience working with investor and utilities. And um, we hope to continue uh, working with them as we go forward, in addition to bringing on the uh, other many qualified folks that are out there in the job market. As far as the uh, $375 million hit to the county, um, that is not a part of uh, any um, proposal that we have uh, before you today. I'm not sure where that number comes from. It might be um, uh, some speculation about potential projects that would be built in the future, but there's, but that's not something that would come out of the county's general fund. That's something um, future dollars would be spent um, based on future decisions and, and no uh, commitment of that sort is being discussed at, at any point right now. And there was another um, question around distribution, and you are correct, uh, Supervisor Adams, that the distribution is handled primarily uh, by our incumbent utility. It is half of the bill that folks will be, continue to receive from the incumbent utility. Folks will continue to pay directly for that service. There is another <coughs> small piece of distribution that happens between the point of uh, delivery from our power supplier getting uh, the power um, onto the California ISO grid. And there are fees that need to be paid to transmit the power from the point of delivery to the point of supply. And those fees are incorporated into the uh, power supply contract, and that is part of what um, our power supplier will be providing to us in the overall cost. If I could answer one one thing I, uh, um, on the distribution angle, and I, I really hate to be put in the position, I wish PG&E were here to speak for themselves, of, of um, passing on their threats. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that Chris Warner, their general counsel, told me late last week that they intend not to sign a distribution agreement with MBA. They claim that they don't, that they are prohibited. This, I'm paraphrasing to my best ability with his threat, and I hate to have to do that. I think they should make their own threat. I think they should make them in writing rather than orally, but that they are prohibited by their um, tariffs from signing distribution agreements with energy producers or distributors or whatever, you know, that they don't believe are legal. And so they're going to use that as one of their ways to try and stop this. And I don't know is that, what, is that legal? I have no idea what the PCPC, but this, uh, obviously they're going to, you know, they will be that's a threat that they may have war of the way to The PUC Oh, good. Um, PG has made the same threat to commission staff, um, and we've told them um, that they're not allowed to make that threat under the commission's tariffs. What they're what they're threatening to do is um, um, decline to accept the commission's uh, the certification I spoke about earlier. Um, PG's opinion, which um, nobody has solicited, that. Uh, they don't think the implementation plan is workable. Um, AB 117 doesn't give the pg &E a role in determining whether the implementation plan is workable. It gives the commission a role in certifying that the implementation plan is complete. So uh, PG&E has taken it on, on itself in the form of Mr. Warner again to uh, uh, inform the staff that um, they would protest the our executive director certification as um, as something that's inconsistent with the tariffs that the commission has um, uh, adopted to govern uh, CC. So if it, if it sounds circular, it is. Um, and so what we're in the process of doing um, is escalating it up to our executive director because um, Mr. Warner's also informed the staff that he'll answer to the commission, but not the commission staff. So um, we've got that problem as well. 
Just can, I ask, can I add one more comment on that, just for folks that want to get more information? Um, our incumbent utility is compelled by Rule 21 of the tariffs to, to facilitate CCA operations um, and to um, allow them to go forward and expedite the process in moving them forward. Um, so we're confident that the CQC will, able, will be able to manage this process. And I wanted to call on Supervisor McGlashan first. And you know, before I do, I, I just want to say, Charles, no matter what, you know, this board decides to do in regard to um, guaranteeing the loan, um, you really need to be commended for your vision and your hard work in this. because um, you, you really have, you mm -hmm. have backed up your vision with intelligence and with passion. And I just think on behalf of the board, we all want to commend you. All right, now let's go ahead and get into the thick of it. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Madam President. So we've come to a fork in the road. One fork relies on the status quo and it may feel more conservative it may feel like lower risk there's a lot of verbiage about insulating the taxpayer from risk and this road that loops back to the status quo may feel even more comfortable <clears throat> because it sounds safer I would submit that we face the reality that that actually is the greater risk road to take. In fact, it is the road. <clears throat> it is the road that is based on a mirage of comfort and it's ephemeral. And in fact, the bottom line is that that is the road to perdition. The road that I want you to take with me today is the road to our destiny. I want to choose the destiny of vision and hope. I want to choose the destiny of economic vitality. We would command and reorient a $94 million revenue stream, if we get to do phase two, into our own community for the sake of employing our own people, employing our own entrepreneurs who are dying for the <coughs> chance to build renewable energy projects, for our local businesses that want to install solar on our roofs and windmills in our backyards, we would take control of our own destiny. And more importantly, we would take the risk and accept the rewards of addressing in an honest, ethical, and noble way the effrontery that we risk seeing coming at us from climate change. I want to walk down that road with you. I want to walk down that road with our citizens that have indicated their support for our bravery today. It is not a risk-free scenario. I acknowledge that. People have tried to portray my commentary as naive or, you know, blasé about the risks. The risks are real. We've got a utility, PG&E, that is going to do everything in its power to destroy this. Make no mistake. But the right thing for us to do as leaders elected by our people to lead is to choose that path to destiny, not the path to the status quo and the less noble hypothesis. So with that, I just want to move option B. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm just going to do a motion at the end of the comments. Is that all right? Okay, great. Supervisor Kinsey. Thank you. Thank you all uh, for, for joining with us. Um, over the last uh, week, I think all of us on the board have agonized with many of you. Um, MEA has certainly been 
wrestling with the challenges for a long time. Um, so in some respects, whatever the outcome is today, it's a relief to have brought this forward, to have this conversation, to make some important decisions. Um, addressing climate change is the single most important public policy issue that uh, our generation will face. We have a lot of work to do on it. Uh, I've said that consistently, I think, in the actions that we have taken as a board at the county level. We have reinforced that commitment in so many different ways. We are committed to climate change. We all have a lot of work to do. We can't do it on our own. Uh, we need to work within, in concert with really the world, which makes this the more awesome task that uh, we've ever faced. Clearly, energy is a critical component of the greenhouse gas strategy. Uh, and um, just to reinforce the historic commitment of this board to community choice aggregation, it may seem almost implausible, but our board took actions for this before Supervisor McGlashan was even elected. So uh, the importance of that is to point out that we've been working on this for a long time. Like my colleagues, I applaud Charles for the leadership he's provided during the last years of this. But our commitment to exploring community choice aggregation has been there for a long, long time. And um, when you think of it, one, we invested hundreds of thousands of dollars, committed countless thousands of dollars of our staff hours to the exploration of this. The, the board unanimously voted to create and join the MEA, and we uh, have um, recently voted to stay in the MEA. I supported those actions, and I still support those actions. Those are the right things for us to do to, to, to ex execute on our commitment to greenhouse gas strategies. We voted to oppose the upcoming PG&E initiative, and I think that it's really important to point out that that initiative is odious. It is uh, really manipulative. It does deserve our complete scorn, and it shouldn't pass, and we should all do everything we can to prevent that. I think we've learned that this lady doesn't like clapping. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, other, the other thing that I will say is this, that um, when I point out risk, it's not to throw cold water on this great idea. It's to be realistic. And I think that there is so much passion in this room. It is apparent in the idea that we have this remarkable bully that is doing everything in its power to prevent us from being on the playground. And we have choices as to how to respond to that. There is a choice to walk out and just call out the bully and say, go ahead, I dare you. And uh, I think we know what the outcome of that would be. I think that that requires us to be very careful and thoughtful as where we go forward. And that's what has caused me to wrestle with this and used up a lot of my running time over the last few weeks in terms of what I think about. The, the issue here today is whether to provide additional financial support to MEA at this critical stage in the form of a loan guarantee. Uh, I think my board knows, I think many of you in the public know that I have consistently said in public that I don't think that the county should go further. We have put 540000 and we've supported it with staff, we've supported it with other funds, um, and I think there are two reasons why I've said that. The most significant of which right here, right now, is this initiative that faces us. If this initiative passes, even if we are able to make and sustain a legal claim that MEA has the right to exist because it preceded the initiative, we will be neutered, castrated, if you will. It will be limiting to 20%, a total of about less than 40 megawatts of power we will face a situation in our state where no one else, none of the other 36 communities that began on this journey with us back in 2003, will be here to start a CCA. We will not be able to implement phase two unless we put every one of our customers into a dark green category. There will be a tremendous limitation to what it is. And when we think of that 40 megawatts against the 44,000 megawatts that the RPS standard is calling for over the next three years, we can see that it is so insignificant. That doesn't make it meaningless, because what has made this whole process and this whole program meaningful is the idea that we are not going to let our future, our destiny, to be determined 
by monopoly corporate powers. We are going to take control of our greenhouse gas future, but all we can be are leaders, inspiration. We are a fraction of a fraction of a percent. So our force and our strength comes from inspiring others to do the same. If this initiative passes, that strength, that power, that ability to make a movement happen is taken away from us unless we can convince two-thirds of the voting public to join in. So I have serious concerns about the timing in, in concert with this uh, initiative that none of us saw coming even a year ago, uh, but is in front of us in a very real way today. The other issue, I've talked about it, and I appreciate folks trying to diminish my concern about risks, but in a startup business, there are a lot of risks. And so I want us to be on the very best foot thing possible if we're going to take on that risk. The county has been there from the beginning. The county has been there with a 530000 to $40,000 unsecured loan. And the county has stayed in the game and committed our energy consumption to MEA. And I want us to continue to do that. But I am not going to be supportive of taking on this additional risk today. I think that the suggestion that I would make to MEA is that it seriously consider why it feels so compelled to move in front of this initiative. Why, why can't we ascertain the landscape at the other end of the initiative? Because if it truly does reduce us to 20% of the vision in our own community and wipe it out everywhere else, is it really the right strategy? And then secondly, I think that in a business at this point in time with no other public partners having stepped up, and I appreciate Fairfax offering to think about it tomorrow night, but we're down to this point in time. None have. Uh, it does seem right for private capital to come to this venture, and I would support that, and I will support continuing to be a member in MEA, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Supervisor Brown, do you have any comments? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's just it's hit me the last couple of weeks that uh, in 28 years of serving in this capacity, I can think of very few issues that I have found as difficult as this one. Uh, <clears throat> I haven't developed a rationale uh, to be as eloquent as my two, the two previous speakers. I have some random thoughts on this. <laughs> Uh, this has been, beyond a shadow of a doubt, one of the most difficult votes I will have taken. Um, I felt from day one uh, that the cities and the towns have, have skipped out. Uh, they, have, they have no exposure and they haven't put a dime into it. I'm very hard to hear that Fairfax is uh, considering uh, stepping up. And I hope perhaps no valuable too, um, and maybe other cities and towns. I think Supervisor Kinsey is right. There is, uh, there is exposure, there is risk. There's probably risk where we don't even know about it yet. And that's very credible. Um, I spent two hours Sunday when I was with our county administrator at my home, talked last night to uh, our county council briefly. Uh, I spent a couple of days ago <coughs> pulling Charles from the the, uh, the ledge uh, of one of our tallest buildings <laughs> over at Mass of Wine. Um, and I told him at the time that I was strongly leaning to oppose it. I'm going to be very forthright with him at the time. Um, th th there's an ideal here, and it's too bad that PGE is is working this way. The ideal would be for the water districts, the county board of supervisors, and PHE need to come together to put something that would be good for all of us. Um, that obviously isn't going to happen. John Newman, who was PGE's representative at the time, stood before us several years ago, said, I'm all for it. Joe, you, you, you voted for this in the, uh, in the assembly. Um, Again, some rambling thoughts by me, I'll end up very shortly. I think we can take that risk. Uh, I'm going to go for this. Uh, I <laughs>
frankly, for Julio yesterday. And for his rationale, and I think he's right on the Um So I, I will support Charles, I should put it that way. I will uh, vote to go forward. Um, but I think we should all do it with our eyes open. And uh, anyway, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Supervisor Adams. Well, how do I? Okay. <laughs> um, um, I, I do have a, a number of comments, and I think what you're hearing, all of you, is what an incredibly difficult decision this is for us. That it's <coughs> when we're experiencing one of the worst recessions that most of us have ever seen in our lifetimes, and the impacts of what's going to come to this county in terms of especially health and human services and dealing with our seniors, our children, disabled people in our community, transit road problems. We have a lot of issues um, that we need to deal with. And I, I do um, appreciate Supervisor McGlashan um, taking this on with a number of very um, passionate members of the community. And I have to say that the emails I've been receiving in spite of the glitzy um, uh, glossy mailer that went out to the community uh, requesting that they show people show up in hordes to um, tell us why this isn't a good idea it's the emails recently have been 10 to 1 in favor of going forward to take your risk. And, the, and and I would appreciate the not clapping thing too because I, I think that you know there are there are it's this is a difficult decision and up and you know I, I have a speech for each for the yes we'll go forward and for the no we won't because I was waiting today to hear the discussions and to hear my colleagues thoughts on this um, the what this does do um, and this is after years of vetting Press. Anybody in Marin County that hasn't heard about Marin Clean Energy by now has not been living here for a while. <laughs> because this has been very well vetted. Um, we have, a, I, I believe, a sound business plan. It's been peer reviewed umpteen times now. We have the CPUC here today saying that they have found no fatal flaws with the plan. According to AB 117, the plan fulfills all of the requirements contracting professionals would be managing the program there'd be stability in this first five years to help us to build a program that is excellent as marin county has in other areas and the plan offers the county the opportunity to access contracts that would provide a higher percentage of clean renewable energy um, than pg e is currently able to offer out or below the pg e rate now we haven't signed that contract yet so i don't know if that's actually going to happen or not, but um, we won't even find out if we don't take <coughs> this next step. The part of the ratepayer payment would come back to the county for the member agencies to pay our energy provider and to use some of that revenue for our own local energy generation and to stimulate jobs, which I know is important to both Supervisor Arnold and the Flash, and we're working on our economic development um, in our community. PG&E has been very public that they're going to do everything they can and they're putting money behind this to make sure that this doesn't work and I can only imagine that the reason they're doing this is because they actually reviewed the business plan and see they see that this actually could work I think if they didn't think it would work they'd let us fail and look terrible and have egg on our face but I think this is a very real risk to their bottom line and in America, I think it is healthy to have some competition. Um, some people bring up the issue about, well, you have to go to a vote of the people. Well, I will say that there are many ratepayers in Marin County that are not registered voters or for a variety of reasons, including they're legally here for 20 years with a green card, but they own homes and properties and they pay rates. So what's the recourse for them then to say, we want a choice and who we get to go with for our energy? Um, you know, Joe Nation, as was brought up before, he helped craft two key pieces of legislation. It was one of the things that we were all very proud of him about with AB 117 and AB 32. And for this presentation from Joe Nation now to be a representative for PG&E to try to undermine this is very disheartening um, for me. And pg e as far as I've heard and from the CSAC report in Sacramento, California State Association, counties 
PG&E so far is the only supporter or endorser for this initiative that is really being put there to protect their monopoly in our state. Um, the, the public seems quick to forget that PG&E has not managed its own house very well, as evidenced by the bankruptcy and the ratepayers that are paying for that. Um, they're not going to be able to meet, by their own admission, the targets, the 2020 targets for renewable energy. And I have a hard time reconciling myself that nuclear is clean when you have to deal with radioactive rod disposal. So even though it can make clean um, deep, uh, greenhouse gases aren't being contributed to, what do you do with all that radioactive waste? Um, CCA is not about Marin taking over PG&E's infrastructure or power plants or the maintenance or management or administration. PG&E still, is still supposed to be doing this according to AB 117 and paid for doing this with the new CCA contract. This is about Marin County contracting for its own energy portfolio. This is something that local governments do. They, they, they develop and implement and administer contracts for a number of services. Um, in, in some regards, this is no different. In others, it's very different. Um, the issue about the grand jury has come up, and I appreciate that very good and thoughtful citizens in our county take the time to provide an opinion about a variety of issues. Um, it's part of the public discussion that needs to always happen, but that doesn't necessarily mean they always get it completely right 100% of the time. We have Marin General Hospital as an example, and the recommendation was made there. The healthcare district board took a different approach. We also have a recommendation regarding consolidation of sewer districts, and the sewer districts took a different approach, and it's an opportunity for the public to hear the pros and cons. Um, the, the other issue that has come up is our own treasurer, who usually, I believe, has provided very cautious and thorough analysis on issues related to our county um, government and finances. But recently, in a discussion that I had with him, um, was not able to confirm that he did a thorough evaluation of all of the documents, business plans, and financials. And, you know, and I was looking forward to having that kind of, of insight. <laughs> Um, I, I, don't, I don't understand um, how you make a decision without having that kind of uh, a thorough analysis, but I certainly was looking for that kind of uh, unbiased analysis from our treasurer. And so, you know, I, I do agree that there are likely risks, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of risks with a lot of things that we do in the county. But that does not always mean that we don't do it. And I think back to Vera Schultz, who, you know, got into you know, a lot of uh, trouble because she really pushed for this building that we're sitting in here today. And it had a lot of fits and starts along the way. And it was a waste of taxpayer money. We put our taxpayers at risk. She actually lost her re-election bid, I believe, um, as a result of it. But here we are today sitting in a building that's internationally recognized and a national heritage. It, it still leaks a little and it still causes us a problem. But people come from all over the world to see this incredible facility. And so, we, you know, sometimes the vision it doesn't always make sense to the, the taxpayers at the moment. But I believe, as Supervisor Brown just said, that there are opportunities for us to take some of these risks and, and go forward. Um, if CCA fails, you know, I wanted to ensure that there would be protections for the ratepayers. And that has been reassured to me. Um, I also, you know, have to say that I am very disappointed that our cities and towns didn't look at this um, in the way that was a, uh, a low risk um, ask for, from their general fund. This is a co-signing of the loan. This isn't putting money in. Our county has already put in, it's, it's actually $850,000 um, into this, and we will not see the 540000 that's the loan part of it, come back if we don't take the chance today. Um, there are many opportunities for the ratepayers to opt out, and I know there's a couple of you in the room that will do that as soon as you get that notice, and that's fair, and we'll, we'll have to be able to decide how we go um, forward with that, but I do believe, in, and I've been reading everything, and I do have a reputation for reading everything and studying it and asking the questions. 
And while there is risk, I, you know, and I didn't know until just today in this meeting how I was going to go with this, I think that we need to continue. <laughs> to be able to be so passionate about a single issue, whether it's community choice aggregation, bike trails, homeless, affordable housing. We as supervisors do not have that luxury. We have to listen to all of the passions and then make priorities. Four years ago, we got a windfall of $25 million in extra ERAF money. And this is before we knew, this is before we had this terrible recession, before we knew that the state was bankrupt. And I remember the board sitting in a workshop coming up with great ideas, sort of like farm families did in the, in the 1930s when they go through the Sears catalog and said, when the harvest comes in, this is what we're going to get. And so we had CCA as one of our issues. We had Marin being a showcase for, for bicycles worldwide. We had the Green Commute. We had a homeless shelter. Fast forward to today, all of those pet projects, we have either had to give up or are going to give up, except for CCA we are facing a $20 million deficit. And so in my mind, this is really the issue is not so much anti-PG&E, and, and we all are disappointed in, in their behavior. It really is, it's a $20 million deficit. In the coming months, this room won't be filled with so many people so excited today, but it is going to be filled with a few people who are saying, if I get laid off, I can't pay my mortgage. How can you do this? If my family is not going to be able to have enough food, and we are going to have to listen to that. And you can say, we really understand it's heart-wrenching, but we're the ones that are going to have to lay them off. And that's what the issue is. And so IHSS workers, they are on the brink of being totally destroyed unless we backfill them. And these are the workers whose children or whose relatives they can't afford to put in, in homes and they stay home and take care of them and we pay them. Probably going to be gone. Health care services for children and for the poorest of the poor are, is going to have to be totally revamped because of the, of the budget facing us. So I, I said this on January 12th, and I'm going to say it again. I, this board has voted for CCA all along the line. I voted yes when the only city I represent voted no. But I said on January 12th, I am not going to commit any more general fund money to this, and I'm going to stand by that. And so now, Supervisor McGlashan, I'm sure you would like to make the motion. Thank you, Madam President. I'll move that we adopt uh, option B, authorizing a cosign of up to a maximum of $950,000. Do we have a second? Supervisor Brown? Aye. Supervisor Kinsey? No. Supervisor McGlashan? Aye. And I vote no. Motion passed. Thank you.